Wendy, did you yeah. see that? Smooth. It was did smooth. You see that? Smooth <laughs> as. <laughs> I'm really impressed the with smoothest that. Smoothest synthetic silk. Hey, folks, exactly. welcome to the Animal Rights Show. The, the once a week spectacular. No, the once a month spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, 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 have to, we have to teach ourselves how to do it all, all over yeah. again. I, I completely <laughs> forget about the internet in between, in between, and then we have to do it all over again. So uh, but welcome along anyway. Now, now 12, 12 times a year. Funky new backdrop, everyone. I like yeah, that. Good, isn't it? We have yeah. a, a guest. We get we have a guest panelist, as you can see, Elon Musk, no less. Hey, yeah, Elon <laughs> Musk is in the house. <laughs> Give us some of your money, Elon. Yes, you can have it all. It, <laughs> remember when he said he was going to give all his money to, uh, if he could save the world, he'd give all his money, and someone like said, okay, well, here's how you would spend it, and he went, oh, I wasn't serious. I really like that about him. He doesn't. He doesn't <laughs> I'd give it all away if I could save everybody. No, just joking. I'm not going to give anybody anything. We're going to Mars. Yeah, exactly. and you, 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 you get trolled by um, people calling you that, uh, Sky. Yeah, just on TikTok. Yeah, on TikTok, people think on the TikTok lives they say, "Wow, it's Elon Musk," and it's funny because I don't. When I look in the mirror, I don't see Elon Musk, and yet. Um, uh, I was thinking Robbie Williams. Robbie Williams. <laughs> Robbie Williams. Oh, I like <laughs> Robbie Williams. That's not so bad. Yeah, I could be. What, what, what was his? Was he in Boy Zone? What was his? Uh, his take name? that. Take that. That's right. <laughs> take Sorry. That, take yeah. that. That's right. It's been a while <laughs> since I thought about Robbie Williams. <laughs> Robbie Williams doesn't have all the, uh, the the star power on this side of the proverbial pond. But um, I know he was. he's big in Europe, Robbie Williams. He's probably he's still big, big there. He's big everywhere. So, Wendy, are you going to do the uh, hellos? Am I doing the hellos? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd love yes, to do, do the hellos. Because we have some wonderful comments today. Oh, we have, who do we have here? Well, hang on, get right to the beginning. Let me go right to the top. We've got Roger Yates here, of course. <laughs> Goes without saying. Please. We've got lovely Deb. Hey, Deb, it's good to see you. And we've got Jeremy the Ape. Jeremy, this is really nice to have you here, Jeremy. Jeremy obviously used to be on the show, but he's now doing other things which maybe he'll come on the show and talk about one day he's, actually he's that would too be good. big for the animal rights show now it's too big now up. it's too big it's outgrown mm. <laughs> outgrown the show but um, he's the go-to go person for language issues so oh. if anyone has yeah, yeah she's yes, your go-to yes, person yes. for language issues definitely and we might be touching on a bit of language today jeremy so stick around uh we got bernie v hey bernie v how you doing it's good to bernie. see you <laughs> bernie yeah bernie. He's a he's Scottish, isn't he? I think he's Scottish. Uh, he's Scottish yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure I'm he Scottish. must hate you doing that accent because you're so bad at it. Uh, I'm bad at it. Well, because I'm because I tell everyone my Scottish accent is just a uh, it's, it's just a Mel, Mel Gibson impersonation. So from Braveheart. Right. So it's an impersonation of an American doing an impersonation. Well, of even Scottish worse, an, he's an Australian American doing ah. uh, an impersonation because yeah. you know he's got a yeah. still. He still has a tinge of when he speaks American. He does sound the still Australian to the key yeah. ear. So yeah, he's my. It's definitely. It's kind of like um, Dick Van Dyke had that yeah. English accent in Mary Poppins, <laughs> but. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> oh, uh, Maury! Oh, Maury! <laughs> Yeah, sure this guy. Uh, Grumpy says, "Stop doing the Scottish accent." And, and, and Grumpy is our tame rock violer, so we'll set him on you if you do it again. Yeah, we will. Hey, Grumpy, nice I to see you there. I thought he was in Cuba. What's he doing here? I thought he was in. He must be. He must be watching in Cuba. He's he's hanging upside down in, in his uh, van cab. <laughs> yeah, right, no, I haven't. Even I haven't even got through the hellos yet, and we're already like halfway through the show. <laughs> yeah. Were you going to say hello to everyone? Who are you saying hello to? Just the, so anyone in the comments? Any, any, everyone in the comments. So we've got, so I just said hello to Benny V, obviously, which took us on a little bit of a Mel Gibson tangent. Um, Galaxy Vegan. Hello, yeah, Galaxy Vegan. Good Galaxy to see vegan. you. Ethically based ex omnivore. These names are getting very creative. That's a good one, though, right? <laughs> ex omnivore. Well. I love ethically based ex omnivore. Mm. Vegan nutritionist, hello oh, to you. I love lovely way there. Oh, look at that, you, you learn something every day. Mel Gibson was born in the United States and America. Right, then he was in Australia from about 10 into his 20s. Yeah, that's right, he was born He was born as a United States citizen, but he was raised in Australia where he did his first movie, which I think was Gallipoli, right? Wasn't Gallipoli his first movie? 
Uh, I'm sure, but thank you, thank you for that, Icy. Mad Max. What? Dystopian. Mad Max. The Mad Max films. Yeah, no, I don't Mad know. Max. I don't... No, Gallipoli was first. He did about the uh, the Australian army, I guess, in Gallipoli. Yeah, I see. I'll probably have that information to hand shortly. I'm sure. Thank you, Icy, <laughs> very much. Um, we have Bernie Brannick. Hello, Bernie. Is Bernie the one who lives over there? Brannick. I've moved. I've moved. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, it used, to, used, to be, used to be over there, but it's um. Hang on. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't I'm know what sure you guys are that. talking about. Yeah. Have you lost me? <laughs> I live over there, but then Roger moved, so now yeah. Bernie doesn't live over there at all. Somewhere. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, further, I'm further away now. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got Paul in the house. Paul Campbell. Hello, Michelle. Bonjour, bonjour. And we've got Canadian Vegan Forever. Hello to you from Canada. Mm, very, uh, very exotic show we've got today. Philip, Labor Day holiday <laughs> greetings from New, New York. I was up to say that. Canada, Canada, <laughs> Canada <laughs> is the epitome of exo exoticism, isn't it? Canada, what an exotic land. Exotic land. I don't, far, never heard, I've, never, yeah, I've never heard of it. <laughs> Canada, exotic. I've never heard that in the same, in the same breath. But I, oh, I, I look I, around, I, Sky. You learn something new. Enjoy it. Look around. Said that the same breath. The first time I visited Canada, I said, "So it's so exotic." It was like the middle of the winter, and all this snow was very exotic for me. I bet in oh, the winter, a winter you see in Canada, Nella? we have yeah. the same wavelength. Yeah, Canadian me and winter, you. I suppose, would be quite indeed a little, a uh, little rough. I couldn't, I couldn't manage it. It's never taken so long to go to the hellos. To get to the hellos. It's <laughs> because of all your tangents, Roger. God, keep us on track, would you? I know, yeah. I'm saying hello to Rose Hill, who is Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. It's lovely to see you. And we've got Joanna Harvin. Hey, Joanna. How good to see you here as well. Of course, we said hello to Grumpy earlier. Grumpy, what are you up to? Thump hit the thumbs up, people. Thanks for that. Um, He's I in see, Cuba. Hey, He's vacationing in Cuba right now. Are you are you in Cuba, Grumpy? Let us know. We've got Joanna Tech six 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 nine. Triple six nine. Uh, howdy, kind folks. Good to see you. And I think is that everyone? Yeah, I think that's everyone. So we got through that. Welcome. <laughs> Time to end the show now. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> and one little thing, just before we carry on, we have a new feature. Oh, yeah. The bell. Nella? Nella? The bells. The bells. We've got a bell. And the reason we have this bell now, we've decided that in order to earn some money for charity, <laughs> obviously it'll be an animal sanctuary, of course, that if anyone uses any speciesist, ableist, sexist, any language like that, we're going to have a bell. And That's then we've got to totally put money, money in the swear jar. Money in the swear jar. I, uh... oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. I, we're going to be rich in an hour. What are we, what are we not with me. No, I'm. Wait, it's ableist, speciesist, and what was the last one? Sexist. Oh, sexist, Roger. Racist. You're toast. Anything. Any any is language is going. Okay. All see, right. See, Jeremy. See, we're hot on the language. Love that. <laughs> hey, look at this bell. Look at this bell, Jennifer. You've it's got, got a little pull on it. it. It's got a little. Perfect pull for the animal rights show. Yes. <laughs> So I, I feel like uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, <laughs> meter my speech constantly. So this is going to be fun. <laughs> Gotta... <laughs> Jeremy thinks this is a great idea. How much are we putting in the jar? I don't know. We've got is some it... money already. Look. I'm not going to read that out loud because I'm afraid I'll have to owe you money. Yeah, what does it say, Sky? <laughs> I can. I, I've. I've. I was a math major. I hardly know how to read. Race. That's like literally that's 20, 20 quid from you, mate. Get it in the jar. Get it in the jar. Get it in the jar, race. Properly either. Yeah, I'm not... yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Well, you owe money, no, grumpy vegan started? granddad. Grumpy. Oh, I like I like his one after that. He has an ableist one in there as well, which is great. Dan, Dan, Danny's going to be bankrupt by the time we finish this show. Um, right. <laughs> Our, our first our first topic the first topic is this one milk shortages inevitable if vegan protesters blockade dairy sites for weeks and first of all <laughs> huge shout out to all the rebels out there that organizing and participating in these wonderful actions very inspiring yes. indeed here 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 so so this we... is the idea is to try and close down is it just the british or is it the 
global? Is it just the British dairy industry? I think industry? it's the British, the British brands. Or oh, fine, right. yeah. dairy, I mean. Okay. So I, there's some interesting pictures here. There's some really good good things going on. So we've got a um, a blockade of the, presumably this is uh, well cow milk, cow food uh, going out or trucks going in to try and get it or something. Yes. So they're blockading mm -hmm. the trucks by hijacking them. Is that what's happening there? They're they're crawling on top yeah, just, and saying just sit, just sit in front of them. I think. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and also uh, there have been uh, activists chained on on trucks and glued on trucks. I think. And then this one is in the shop one. Yeah, so yeah, so I think they occupied a, a few supermarkets in there and blockaded the the aisles selling cow's milk. I don't think yeah. that would fly in the states or in Canada. I mean, in Canada, you know, they they run over activists, and in America, they just spray people tear gas sitting in the if they're occupying in britain i don't think you guys don't, don't take such a heavy hand do you well uh, i've got a little film to show you in a second which was a bit heavy um should we should we tell our viewers um who our guest is well, yes we should i'm sure they know him but we should anyway do we even bother <laughs> figure it out. Elon Musk, I thought, was the. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> you said Elon Musk and Robbie Williams. We didn't say actually who's got it. Yeah. What it what it is is Elon Musk looks in the mirror and see, and sees Skyjack Morgan uh, mm. every morning, and and so Sky is our guest panelist. So welcome along, Sky. Um, you, you don't have to be shy. You can speak. Don't don't worry. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thank you so much because uh, I was I was really worried that I would be a little lost for words. Uh, you know me, I'm so uh, I'm so terse with my with my diction. I don't really like to talk very much. <laughs> but I have my own show, and I guess I should plug it right now. My name is Sky Jack Morgan. I'm vegan, of course. You can go to YouTube.com/slash/vegan, of course, and check out my show. I'm live daily at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Pacific Daylight Time, right now, right? And then on Sundays, we do Vegan Sunday School at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Have you got that written down? <laughs> you just sounded like you totally rehearsed that, yeah. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> like auto cue. Well, you know, like you say it enough times on TikTok and stuff like that, it kind of becomes part of almost uh ritualistic doesn't it? it's in the it's in the old repertoire uh, sky lost it. for words says rose hill yeah you know me out of the clear blue sky i'm able to i'm able to pluck a few words here and there that that's that's only part of a name a, a full name is rose hill i'm jennifer rose hill i'm jennifer yeah oh i like that rose hill i'm jennifer got it now i know who she actually is indeed <laughs> the, the jig is up the oh i wasn't gonna say it i can't uh, that was a speciesist thing i was gonna say the um how how would you say i i don't know how the whatever is out of the bag how would you say the jig is up i guess is all you can say what's the the non-speciesist equivalent to the feline is no longer in company are pack. you here <laughs> jeremy Jeremy will know. Jeremy knows what is Jeremy, what is. Jeremy, Jeremy will have written an article on it. Don't Probably. let the blank out of the bag. What would you say? Because I can't. I don't want to give any money. I'm broke. I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say Ready? it. Ah. <laughs> I don't know. Is... I'm not sure about that one. So the yeah the um. The, hmm. You. Hmm. Oh, you spilled the tea, right? Isn't that the thing? You spilled the tea. <laughs> well, I've never heard that one, but. C Colleen Patrick Goodrow would know. Oh. And that that gives you another, another, another know. plug there, Sky. Yeah, she's coming on the show on Sunday. On sorry, on Wednesday, on the seventh Wednesday, Colleen Patrick Goodrow will be on, and so will Roger actually on Wednesday the seventh. So please, maybe we should ask her what is the non-speciesist equivalent to let the blank out of the bag. So race is saying letting the cat out of the bag is perfectly vegan, which. It's in true. Effect, it's not. True. That is, you uh, rang the bell. You just said it. That is a speciesist comment. I'm, you can't that's, just, I'm that's reading it. That's liberation. Like that. That is, that's yeah, that's what, if, we, if we think of it as liberation, yeah. So liberating the cat out of the bag is a very 
No way. Yeah, because thing to do. Thing to do. The cat is in the bag in order to fool someone else. You're exploiting your it's a rights violation. The cat is in the bag in the first place. If you let the cat out of the bag, it's not because you're literate you're you're liberating it, is that you've you've exposed <gasps> yourself as a trickster. Oh <laughs> what? That's the first one. It wasn't me. It, it certainly was. No way. It what was. did I say? You said you're, eat. You're, Eat? You punishable by hanging. What did I say? You let you said the cat and you said you it said first. It. No, oh. no, you said letting the letting it out of the bag. This is punishable by hanging. Cat, am I? <laughs> it's punishable oh, by yes, hanging. you are. <laughs> yeah. Let her. Assume, <laughs> assume that the cat is male. If, uh, uh, if you want to let them, serious, if then you let them with this, they 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 do, you know, like in um in hair coursing. Um, they do um, train uh, the dogs and dog fighting. They train the dogs by putting cats in bags with their with their claws out of the. Why right, they you do, know. do that? So yes. letting the cat out of the bag would be perfectly vegan in that uh, circumstance. So only um, if you were the liberator, like if you were wearing the balaclava and like rushing into the dog fight and then snatching the bag to let out the cat, whether it be male or female. And of freeing <laughs> him or her. That's, that's so you, a can good... say you can say they. You they can is, say they. They I'm is not sure. grammatically inaccurate. Well, <laughs> yeah, but it is very. <laughs> it is pretty shite, though, isn't it? So it's either be discourteous, be discourteous to my grammar, or be discourteous to the hypothetical cat. Hmm. No, but it's not about grammar. It's about the status. Isn't it? True, it's, but it's, this is a hypothetical stated. cat. You're right. Yeah, right. we don't that, care about um, grandma. It is an imaginary cat at this point. <laughs> Deb is asking me who is this, and I assume she's asking about the cat here a while ago. Um, this is Jo, and I, I actually found her in a bag. She was thrown away in a in a paper bag. Never let the cat oh out gosh. of the bag. Oh, you, you left the cat out of the bag. That's pretty good. Yeah, I did. <laughs> this guy goes UK oh. visa. No, I don't. I haven't registered with the police. To I think it's bizarre okay. that that in the UK when you move you have to register with the police to tell them where you live. It's so interesting. Now I think the controversial thing that um, Animal Rebellion have done is this one in Harrods. Let me just play this for a couple of seconds. Oh, it's not very workers' rights, is it? Kind of. Do you suppose they put the wet floor sign up, or did Harrods? Good point. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that. That's an interesting one. But um, I was just wondering about the people in the comments about because we think that that was like a one-off, and we were speculating on whether that was because they got a lot of negative feedback, even within their own community or, or something, because. Um, I, I saw a lot of kind of vegans going, well, I'm a vegan, but, you know, I've, I find that, that one pretty uh, difficult, you know. Mm. Uh, funny enough, Benny said this on, on, on TikTok, you know, you, you guys are crying over spilt milk. You ought, to, you ought to go and have a look in a slaughterhouse. So it, 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 did, it did create quite a lot of discussion. And, of course, that's really the entire idea, really. But if I go back to Twitter, there's some interesting <coughs> stuff here. There's um, yeah, there's Benny's comment there. If you see that, um, and then this one here, uh, Paul Richards. Can you see that one there? Uh, how is it a bad thing to get milk from an animal? They are not harmed in any way. What exactly is, are you protesting against? So, mm. it's it's interesting from a vegan point of view, isn't it? That somebody would presumably, if that's a genuine uh, point. Because we tend to we tend to think now that people have got a fairly good grasp of what veganism is, and and what it what it stands for, uh, and yet here's somebody making a kind of comment that you would you would get thirty years ago, which is yeah. which is pretty interesting. And then another one I saw, which was where was that? Um, you say thirty years ago, but I mean, aren't you still surprised that people 
I meet people every day now, not literally meet them, but like online that say they didn't know they they they're completely oblivious to the plight of animals in um, who are being exploited for the milk and dairy dairy and uh, egg industries. They don't even see the connection. Yeah, and of course, one 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 part of this story, of course, is the, is the fact that people are willfully ignorant uh, of of the details, and so it's the same as um, I was speculating with Rose Hill earlier that if we were to say just go outside a shopping centre and ask people, uh, you know, ha- ha- can you kind of say what your opinion is about what goes on in in a slaughterhouse. Mm. They might say something vague, you know, like, well, that's where the animals are killed to create meat. And then if you were to say, well, you know, could could you describe any of the details? The chances are that most of them are going to be saying no to that, right? And so, you know, even, even though there's a lot of vegan education and it's been going on now for 15 years, there's still a heck of a lot of ignorance out there, whether, whether willful or not, really. It does. I mean, people know what vegans eat and what they don't eat, but they don't really know why. And uh, not eating other animals is kind of obvious for, right. for, uh, for people that eat animals. I mean, they can assume that we don't want our animals to be killed, but uh, people are not familiar with the concept of rights. Uh, they are more familiar with the concept of cruelty. And in most cases, in my opinion, they don't realize that there is cruelty and rights violation involved in, in the dairy industry. Because we've been trained since since we were like toddlers, we've been trained to think that uh, the cow give us the milk and the hen give us the eggs and all this BS. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it's it's interesting. When I went vegetarian at the age of 15, I think that I was thinking, you know, well, I don't want to benefit from the death of animals. I remember at 15 years old saying something like that along those lines. And it's I didn't think that there was death being caused by eggs and dairy. And now so many years later, you know, 30 years later, you're absolutely right. I think I feel like Roger, I'm going, how, how are people still not aware? I went, at 30 years ago, I thought that today how are people still thinking that and i i don't know if it's willful ignorance or if it's a product of how a product of the machine that's behind kind of obfuscating what's happening in uh, the eggs and dairy industry i feel like it's a google search away but who's googling it right mm. what, what 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 do we think of this one um this is from grumpy all activism is good good activism and then i think uh race is i think that might be a, an add-on to that i'm not not quite sure but I mean, do we do we believe um people in the comments panel that all activism is good at activism there's no, no such thing as uh, as bad press kind of um position i mean i've 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 said this certainly in in the past what do, what do you think i, I suppose totally it depends agree. what where you're you know what what the point of the activism is if if it is just raising um kind of getting attention and all activism and, and obviously the more controversial the activism is the more attention you'll get probably but then i guess it's then what effect does that have in terms of um a ripple effect and the changes we want to bring about so are we creating education are we creating awareness um are we just making people more resistant to our message i suppose that we don't and the thing is i don't suppose we really know until it happens we don't know what the effect of that will be and also there isn't a one size fits all some people are going to respond to controversial actions and disruption in a way that they're just their barriers are up and they just completely outraged others might actually take an interest and want to look into what that why those people are taking so much time and effort to protest this so there's going to be different people responding to different activism so i suppose in a way you could say all activism is good if it gets attention from different people but then what the long-term effects of the activism will be is hard to tell isn't it and, and we don't really measure that or we don't really have a way of measuring that yeah you know there, there's some interesting sociology on this in the sense that um it was found that um in terms of what the public like in terms of activism 
uh, which is kind of was brought uh, broadly kind of drawn in this research. Things like petitions right up to disruption and all that kind of stuff. The the public like the kind of stuff that the press are not interested in. And so this is the dilemma for the activists, because if you want to get in the press, you've got to do eye catching stuff like pouring milk all over Harold. Uh, I keep saying Harold. I don't know yeah. Harold <laughs> okay. Harry. Harry. It's called Harry. Harrod, Harrod's floor. Uh, and, and thus potentially up, upsetting some of the uh, of the audience. So, you know, you've got you've always got that dilemma. And of course, then you've got the media spiral, because the next time the animal rebellion does that type of thing, the press are liable to say to them, oh, well, we, you did that last week. So, you know, t- tell me when you've got something new. And they 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 will then when they say something new, they mean something more dramatic, usually. So right. so there's there's, a, there's always a push to push activists into into more dramatic or more illegal type things. It sounds like the press is actually the one radicalizing them into the T word at that point, isn't it? I mean, um, you don't you don't want to be called the T word, but uh, in order to get the press's attention, sometimes we're drifting into that territory, aren't we? Mm, not we are not, because in, in reality, we have nothing to do with terrorists. Well, some people would call the ALF and various organiz- you know, wings of the... Yes. Uh, but they never hurt anyone. They never hurt anyone. Worst case scenario, in some cases, uh, property was damaged. That well, that's what. All. Well, yeah, and then the and then people use people start calling people terrorists when property is damaged. I mean, that's common. Well, I threats think are made. Threats can be made against individuals, can't they? Even right. though maybe no harm is done. So yes, yeah, so that and I guess that would feed more into that language, wouldn't it? The terrorist language. If someone's threatened. Yeah, I mean, when eco terrorists. Uh, I mean, burn down a Hummer dealership, they're called terrorists, even though I might say, no, that, wait a second, those aren't terrorists. Let's not throw that word around so so you know easily. But that's what people will call them. That's what the press will call them. And it's almost as if in order to get the, the, the attention of the press, that uh, eco, eco advocates will have to then kind of blur the lines between terrorism and activism. Hmm. And Okay, just to pursue what I was saying before, is is this is this an answer to Danny to Grumpy? Because it, it it's always been a bit worrying, isn't it? Um, this idea of uh, blockading and and you know, kind of as it were, um, prolonging the, the suffering or the ordeal ordeal of other animals on the way into a house of slaughter. It's a tough one, that one, isn't it? Hmm. It sounds like a welfare argument, Roger. What you just made. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I'm just, I'm just t- talking about the argument that is 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 put forward in in the sense that, um, you know, you you are you are kind of um, prolonging the ordeal. Um, although, I think you can argue that either way because um, you could say you know, you're keeping lot, them alive. There's lots, of, there's lots of delays in the in the supply in, into you know, you know, if 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 there's a few, if there's a few too many. Everything slows down, but anyway, and all that, and and in Ireland at least, they tend to starve them for twenty four hours before they put them through the slaughterhouses because the the farmers That's are deep. supposed to do it, yeah. but they know that the farmers are unreliable, and so therefore the house of slaughter does it, which means that if the farmers do do it, then that means the other animals are going to be starved then for forty eight hours, and so they're going to be punished um, if the farmer abides by the rules on the grounds that the slaughterhouse expects a lot of the farmers not to abide by the rules so you know as as usual the other animals are stuck in a human kind of you know uh, created problem you know i guess you know can any activism in any activism can cause negative repercussions though and the uh, the question being you know whether or not activism is all activism good activism right i think is the the fundamental question here and to me it's yes because noise right Active, activism is about making noise and yes some of us will be more susceptible to certain types of noises right we all have a noise filter on our brains and some of us will let certain certain pieces of it in other others won't like what Wendy was saying like you have you have the ability to block you you're not going to respond the same way to different types of noise 
activism is just making that noise. And I think the more of it, especially in this case, when it's the situation is so dire and the solution is so urgently needed, that the more noise, the better, the louder, the better. Um, I, I, I do, I do think that some of these more ostentatious and even like more dramatic things are necessary because the press is the gatekeeper to a lot of that. And, um, you know, I, I'm on the all, all activism is good activism when it comes to animal rights, not just animal, just rights and justice, rights and justice. We need more people talking about rights and justice. Well, the answer to that, what you just said, Sky, is this. Not from certain things like PETA, do the KKK thing. The KKK yeah. thing about the American Kennel Association, like way back, is that what he's talking about? Or she, sorry. Um, yeah, it's the one, the one, the one when they dressed up as the they dressed up as man. as the mm-hmm. KKK in order to make fun of the AKC, which I, I found that that wasn't. I it was a commercial that they had banned that they intentionally had banned from the Super Bowl, right? Which where the KKK stood up and they were at the wrong meeting because they were supposed to be at the AKC meeting um, because of the yeah, purebred dogs, they, right? They, um, they actually did it on the street. They they actually did it with stalls and stuff. Oh. Yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't just um, a media thing. It was uh, an actual on the street uh, thing. Um, Steve, Steve Best in in his Total Liberation speech uh, picks up on it and says, you know, oh that you know that that's a real bridge builder, folks. You know, in terms of alliance politics, which was his big thing. You know, so well alliance politics. Uh, I mean, I may be talking out of school a little bit here, but you know, like if 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 dressing up like a KKK member gets people talking about the um associating the ideas of oppression then and 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 how oppression is equal and the oppressors are equal when it comes to who they're oppressing i think that's fine because you're still you're still comparing the oppressor like this is something that bothers me a lot and people say well don't compare human slavery to animal slavery well i'm not comparing human slavery to animal slavery i'm saying that the oppressor and their methods and the defense of their oppression is identical because the arguments for the arguments to to defend the the rights of the slave owner and the and the state rights were the same as they are today for uh, the oppressors of animals. But Steve, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, black people go, being out there in the street for whatever reason and stumbling upon uh, white people dressed as gay, gay, gay. I mean, th- yeah. that's hurtful and harmful and it's true. Respectful. It's certainly um, something that I think should be considered. But if we're talking about something, I don't know. First of all, the black people I know are used to that type of shit. They're used to seeing that type of thing. Not Maybe not KKK people walking around, but it's going to be, oh, there's some racism. I think that they're kind of used to that. And the, and if, if, if they're upset by it then and they're not vegan then maybe they should be associating the ideas of the KKK with the oppressors of animals. That's something that people like Jay-Z and and Beyonce are talking about. A lot of African-American voices are making that connection. Angela Davis talks about it. Even uh, Coretta Scott King talks about the association between the KKK and organizations like the KKK and uh, what's happening to animals. I don't think that that's... I I think there are... I think it's... I suppose it comes down to us again and we, we have these conversations and and again it's very, very tricky, but I, I suppose it comes down to us that who is who is making the comparison. Like, mm. you know, if if we as white people go, Well, it's fine for us to dress as the KKK because we you know, we're making this comparison between the oppressors of of uh, black people, enslaved people and other animals, then but then we haven't we are not from that group does that make sense like for example it's e- it would be easy for a man to say to a group of women oh well it's f- it's fine for 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 us to like make you dress up in like stockings and suspenders and get out on the street and and like you know appro- appropriate your bodies to sell veganism or whatever but as a woman i might have a t- totally different view and is it down from is it for a man to tell me as a woman actually that's fine because i might go actually as a feminist i don't f- i don't feel it is fine you well, know what I mean? So I suppose it is who is who are we and who and and that's I. That's interesting because you're talking about like the the men who would tell a woman to go do that, but but the observer, the passerby, would be 
I think I think you're absolutely right. The 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 person in the who is who is being asked to go and do this form of activism, absolutely. But the passers by, how they feel about it, is kind of the point, right? It's kind of the point, uh, is to push their boundaries and to 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 stick it to them a bit. Um, and is it maybe sometimes hurtful? Yes, but all of these things we're talking about are hurtful. It's hurtful. It's even I think a little harmful when we point out people's cognitive dissonances and talk about how they're they're hypocrites because that's a lot of what vegan is vegan activism is right we're going out and saying you're a hypocrite because this oppression is like that oppression i mean i totally agree with you what you're saying about like it is not a man's place to go tell a woman to go where i don't know what stockings and, and suspenders means but i think you mean like uh, the the, the uh, vegan, oh what do you like, uh, like the that, lingerie uh like, yeah, lunch, yeah lingerie uh, so suspenders are I don't know what you call those. Well, suspenders are like the things that firemen wear, the the ones that go over the shoulders. <laughs> oh, like braces. Oh, yeah. No, no, oh, braces. That's about. right. You guys call them braces. <laughs> Damn braces. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rock on, Tommy. Stockings and suspenders. <laughs> Roger, you'll remember that. Rock on, Tommy. But um, <laughs> the thing is, is, in my opinion, that one cannot, I mean, um, highlight the objectification of one group by objectifying another. Right. I mean, there's something to be, there's certainly a nuance in the activist community that needs to be addressed. But I don't think you're absolutely right that a man isn't the one who's going to say, oh, well, a woman go out there and wear stockings and suspenders in order to get attention. You're absolutely right. But if a woman like like Tash Peterson or one of these uh, others who, 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 who employ these tactics of the uh, putting their bodies on display in order to get the attention, that's up to them. That's their body. They can do whatever they want with it. Um, I don't know who's in these KKK outfits. I don't know who's wearing them. I'm hoping it's not just some cishet white guy. I don't know. I don't know what, what I think that's kind of the point of the costume, right? Is that you don't really know who's under them, under the sheets. Um, and obviously PETA has got everyone talking because I don't think they did this activism for, it's been a long, long time since they did the KKK thing and we're still talking about it. So so objection to it. I think the the thing uh, building on what, from what Wendy said was, and then what you said, Sky, was that you know a person of color is not going to see that, and then consider veganism. I mean, if you if you walk around the corner and there's a table and there's three people dressed up as the KKK, um, even even if it's associated with an animal issue, I would have thought that you know associating that with veganism is going to be the last thing that they do in the, in their minds. Be, be, before they come to the conclusion that it was totally inappropriate. Maybe inappropriate is something that I, I, I'm, is it inappropriate? Probably. Is it, uh, and I'm not going to put my, my, I'm not trying to put myself in the shoes of, of, again, a person of color who's walking down the street and seeing this. But the question is not associating this with veganism. The, the question is, you're the oppressor. You hate the KKK. You hate the KKK and you hate oppression. You are the KKK. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are. You are the KKK because you are oppressing animals every day, three times a day. That's that's at the very minimum. That's We're not even talking about animals entertainment and fur and skin, right? Three times a day, you're doing the same things that the KKK, worse things than the KKK really ever did. So it's you're a fascist. I mean, you know me, I'm like, you're either vegan or you're fascist. I suppose um, it comes down to as well, do we, should we appropriate the oppression of others to ooh, fight the oppression of, of, of others? Do you know what I mean? Are we, if we're anti-oppression, should we, yeah. yeah, are we jumping on that? Are we jumping on that appropriation of like someone's oppression and then going, okay, we're just, we're going to tread all over you and your oppression to get justice for this group. Because so then that's a that really becomes... good point. Yeah, but I would argue that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But I, I, I would really. But I'm excited because I would really argue. <laughs> what's a bell for? Did I say something? Oh, say just, it again. Yeah, just because oh. you cut me off. That's, that's the new rule. You cut me oh, off is why you get a bell. <laughs> too. Sorry, I'm passionate about that's animal okay. rights. So uh, <laughs> we're missing the bell. That's the only reason for it. But the idea of uh, appropriating the oppressed. I don't think is what's at play here. What you're doing is you're appropriating the symbol of the oppressor. It'd be the same thing as putting a swastika on a slaughterhouse because you're not you're not using you're not appropriating the identity of the Jews who were killed during the during the um, during uh, the Holocaust in Germany and, and and Poland. You're appropriating the symbols of the oppressor. Like people in in, in my activist life, you know. 
20 years almost vegan. And I've heard all of these things like, oh, well, you're comparing these people to animals, these people to animals. First of all, I don't, I think we're all animals. So I don't think that that's such a horrible thing, but I know that some people take offense fine, but I'm not even doing that. I'm comparing the oppressor of people to the oppressor of animals. And that's an important distinction. I'm not appropriating the experience of other human beings. I'm experience. I'm appropriating the symbols of oppression and I'm not even actually doing the one because I'm not dressing like the KKK or using yeah, swastikas. Well, well, but I, mean, I, I, I get that. I get that point um, strongly. And I do believe that, you see, that, I mean, this brings up, um, you know, a discipline in sociology called ethnomethodology, which is basically the kind of work that um, members of the public do to understand each other. And although you're, you know, you've got a particular um, position in terms of what you're putting out there, you can't really... Um, it gets decoded by your audience. And, and yes. so even if we want to talk about the animal holocaust, people hear the holocaust. Right. And in fact, sometimes animal activists are a little bit sloppy with the language and they will make comparisons between what goes on with other animals and the holocaust. Whereas for this thing to work, you'd have to be very careful that you're almost like saying, I'm not talking about the Holocaust, I'm talking about the animal Holocaust. And so it would need a lot of explanation to get over the nuances of the point because people are not going to see that. They're just going to react to what they feel they've initially seen. But and, isn't the and, reaction important, Roger? Isn't that important to plant that seed? If you can get someone to laugh... It's, it's, a, question, you could... it's a question of if any seed is planted or whether you've actually blocked them from listening yeah but like i said i think that some will be blocked and some will be opened it's just the same thing as as if you know some some people will catch lung cancer some people will catch colon cancer but the same thing caused it um it was still it was still the cigarette or the roundup in the water you know it's 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 just that you were more susceptible to one type of cancer versus the other and the same thing happens with ideas your brain has a filter some of them will get through some of them some of them will allow those uh, seeds to be planted some love need that jarring horrible thing some people need to watch dominion you know i didn't need to watch dominion uh, dominion didn't exist when i went vegan but i didn't need to watch slaughterhouse footage someone just needed to tell me one day that I was a hypocrite and if I'm against violence and oppression, I need to go vegan. That's all it took. Other people, they need to have more, you know, different different languages. And by the way, I think that using symbols is treacherous, always. Using the cross, the cross means different things to different people. The American flag means different things, vastly different things to different people. And it's the same symbol. The symbol's doing very little. It's the interpretation of that symbol that it means everything. Right. Do you agree that it's very difficult to draw meaningful comparisons and uh, really uh, successfully express an analysis about oppression and, and the source of oppression and comparing oppressors in size bites, phrases or, you know, a, a picture? I mean, I would acknowledge that it would be extreme. It's extremely difficult to talk about any of these things. But when we're saying, at least I'm saying, when I personally am saying that veganism is about rights and about liberation and it's about anti-oppression and anti-violence, it, it behooves me to take on those more difficult symbols and comparisons because I don't want to get tied down to a conversation about animal cruelty or animal welfare, which I'm not guaranteeing that no animal's ever going to get killed in a vegan world. I'm not guaranteeing that no animals will ever suffer again, that we're not, I'm not ending, I'm not, my, my pitch is not that I'm ending suffering, right? My pitch is that everyone should be encountered as rights bearers and, and, and everyone yearns to be free and therefore should be promoted. Freedom should be promoted and not hindered or abridged, empty the cages, um, so it, it, it's, it demands of me to talk about things that are harder to talk about, like ideas of what oppression is or what liberation means. So yeah, it's, it is, it's harder. You're absolutely right. But if not, the other, the other, the alternative is to talk about animal welfare, which to me is kind of a boring, no, nothing statement. Oh, I, I want animals to be treated better. Like, no, I, I don't. I don't think that follows, Sky. I think we can talk about animal rights, but we don't have to do it by evoking 
you, you know, um, you know, putting swastikas stickers on, on slaughterhouses. No, I agree with you on that. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry, Roger. That's not what I mean. I mean that, uh, like to Nella's point that it is difficult to have those conversations. And when you try to put them into like sound bites or like quick comparisons, you will get in trouble because when you use symbols and all that, it is treacherous. It's difficult. But like I said, is all it, the, the question is, is all activism good activism? I'd say yes, because some people will get the nuance. Some people won't. Some people need the hammer. Some people need the chisel. Some people need the scalpel, you know, and the more you're doing it, the better. And I like the noisemakers. I like the agitators, you know, you know, I was agi- an agitator. An agitator is something that in that shakes the shakes the dirt off. Right. Look, look at that. People. Right. That'll, put, that'll put people right. off their supper, won't it? Well, Grace, you better get another 50 quid in that jar, mate, because. <laughs> <laughs> so, Grace, needs to, Grace needs to go to work just to put money in that jar because. <laughs> Roger's going to be in suspenders and uh, was it stockings and suspenders? Mm, and braces. What do, call, what do you call them? What do you call them in, um, in your lingo, Sky? Garters. Stocking garter belts, right? Garter belts and garter belts. Um, yeah, the garter belts and I guess we wouldn't even say stockings. We would say um, leggings, maybe. I don't know, <laughs> leggings, really? Leggings go all the way up. Leggings go all the way okay. up. But um, do you know what? I didn't think we'd have this conversation today. Fun enough. <laughs> yeah, they're called know, garters. Yeah, they're called garters. I didn't see this one coming either. To be fair. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, look, we've we've got about a quarter of an hour left. So, um, ah. Sky, the f- the future is vegan. The future is vegan. Of course, this is our title. Yeah, <laughs> vegan. Of course, it is. <laughs> yeah, this, the future is vegan. Um, absolutely. What do you think, Roger? Do you think the future is vegan? Well, I hope so, given the fact that I've dedicated quite a lot of my time to it yeah <laughs> and it, will, it will piss me off a little bit if i've completely wasted it i suppose but um yeah why not um you know we need to uh i suppose there's there's, there's pressures now towards um well it's a complicated question actually because veganism is growing and mm. yet veganism is alt being altered should we the say. vegan movement is being offered. Yes, it's being altered. Yeah, and so and um, yeah, and so I'm. Mm. So the future might be plant based, but I, I guess I, I I like the the vegan is I say the veganism is a future because I don't think there's much of a future for humanity without a vegan uh, future. I don't think there's much of a future for us um, if because a, a non vegan future means one of endless wars for re- for dwindling resources. That's that's endless. I say endless. It's not endless. It will end when we're all gone, and it will be over resources that are in t- that are dwindling. Even though we are completely p- capable right now to to stop it, there's that's what's so shocking is that I remember as a kid we were celebrating Earth Day and stuff like that, and I truly believed that we're clearly going to do something about this, and yet um, nothing really has been done as far as I can see. It's just getting worse. I don't really think it's getting better. Um, but uh, certain things are happening. I mean, I, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. And I think that the social justice movements and uh, protests and the fact that we have more kind of intellectual capital that's being spent on these things, are I think that, that we're moving towards that. And, and, and also, uh, I want to shout out to all my plant-based people out there that don't even care about <laughs> – they only care about the way they look or the environment. I'll take it. I'll take it if it means saving humanity and, um, and saving all animals on Earth. I'll, I'll take it. Um, Do you think, because thinking about the the whole cli- can't speak, climate crisis, because mm-hmm. I feel like often, and, and as humans, I feel like we tend to go into breakdown before we get breakthrough. We tend to go into catastrophe yeah. before we, we almost go to the brink of something, yeah, cata- some catastrophe or crisis before we then learn and go, oh, we've got to clamber out of this. It's almost like that, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention kind of thing mm. isn't it mm. and i just wonder if if we are heading that way if we are heading heading to you know this this climate catastrophe that people are not really waking up to or even if they kind of agree okay this exists now i do believe it but they're not willing to make changes we're heading towards this kind of 
catastrophe we're already in it like we're not, we're not heading there we're already in it it's started we can see it around us um but do you think that if we're going that way and if it's going to be a sense of um a, cha a more challenging environment and we are going to be there's going to be a massive scarcity of resources land food water there's going to be you know a different environment in terms of temperature where we can even what 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 part of the planet is inhabitable for for humans and other animals do you think that with human nature as it is we're going to be more pushed to be more human centric because we're going to be like hang on a minute Ooh, i need to survive my family need to survive fuck you lot fuck you other species like we it's all about survival now it's like we're going to be pushed into survival mode fight or flight and and i wonder if we're going to go more down, up sorry to be doing gloom this is just a question i ask myself are we going to be pushed more into that because you see even even just in the covid the pandemic crisis we did not give a frick about all the masks that ended up in the sea and no. the rivers and that have completely devastated some you know some of the the water and the the sea and river creatures that live here that um, wasn't even species I mean, this i mean we didn't care that the uyghur population in china was the ones making them right this oppressed class no. of muslim chinese that were being you know that most of most of these masks were made by slave labor i mean we don't really seem to care about that either um Absolutely. well I think, I think i think the point about um having to you know come right to the edge is is proven by things like pakistan surely I mean, mm. if if all of us in whatever country we're viewing this from was imagining that a third of their country would be underwater, yes. thousands dead, right? I mean, thousands. We're we're talking like Pearl Harbor level, uh, World Trade Center level casualties yeah, and already. Then, and then, of course, the thing that follows a flood is waterborne diseases, which is the next. Right, all the problem. all the basically the alphabet soup of hepatitis comes out and uh, E. coli and all the rest. We we went through it with Katrina here. Katrina, the worst the worst uh, storm in American history, directly caused by climate change. And it's not just climate change, by the way, because we've dealt with environmental difficulties before, like with the Dust Bowl. But what we had were petrochemicals to, in order to solve those problems. The issue now is going to be there's not enough petrol to go around, like. Uh, fossil fuels, we are also facing peak oil. So when we go, when, when these climate change, these, these, these catastrophes happen, if you, and if you, if you read anything about all these wonderful technological um, cures to all of our ailments, it's always a petrochemical that's, that's there at the ready, right? We have one tool in the tool belt and it's petrochemicals. Well, Petrol's running out. And if we are past peak oil, which a lot of people think we are, then we're just going to get more adventurous in how we will mine it, how we will get. That's why fracking is a thing now, because we always knew the oil was there. But now it's it makes sense to get it out because it's so expensive now. It's causing so. So we'll fight more wars over that because it's going away. Water. It's easy, it's easy to be it's easy to be pessimistic, isn't it? Because, like you say, you know, a third of Pakistan is underwater and yet. You know, if you if you are a, a soccer fan in Britain, a football fan in Britain, you know the, the Premiership and all the other leagues are still going. The, the TV's on, the electricity's on. No, nobody's going to notice. Then, you, then you've got the situation of the elite situ situation. It seems to me that they must be thinking another kind of, you know, level down, kind of because they're going to be the ones who think they've got enough money to get out of this. And they're going to be the ones who probably are going to be the last affected by anything that ever happens because they're going to have the resources to do something about it. And I find that sentiment so interesting and a very American one. And because it's very kind of, you know, we, we ensure that the uh, that the that the oil dollars that are, you know, we, we extract the oil from the earth. And instead of the money going to the people living right on top of it, the money goes to New York and London. But when we have something like the World Trade Center, the lesson is not that they hate us for our freedom, which is what was sold to us in order to get us into two uh, foreign wars. It was what happens to the most impoverished, the ones who are who are the most oppressed, can directly affect what happens to the richest and the freest. That is exactly what should have been learned that day. But yet that lesson was entirely squandered, was entirely left aside. What's happening to the to the least of us directly affects what's happening to the the the, but, the but most well off. And the same thing goes with lag, animals. Isn't this guy? There's a time lag. I mean, for example, like we said, I mean I'll say it three times. 
a third of Pakistan is underwater, and yet we're on, you know, we're on um, StreamYard. You know, we're unaffected by it. There's a t time lag. So even if, if it's gonna, it's coming our way, it's mm. going to be a while, isn't it? Yeah, but I think that time has passed now when it comes to what's happening to animals it directly affects humanity. Like it, it, we, they, we seem to look at it like, oh, well, we're not all, we're not all one thing. We're like we, we are all one. And I think that there's more and more of that kind of language going around. We're all one. We see, we see it more with uh, religions. Even they're changing their tune. We're all one. You know, what happens to the animals affects us because we're also animals. We're all on the same planet together. Um, you know, I think that, I, I think that that time lag has already, we were, we've already telescoped in, like we're already there. Um, do you think that people that... Re will realize that? I mean, the majority of people, of non-vegan uh well, I don't think we need. I don't think we need the majority. We need. I make this comparison all the time. You know, there was a time when everyone was wearing bell-bottom jeans. It, when when they stopped selling bell-bottom jeans, it wasn't because nobody wanted bell-bottoms. Just enough people stopped buying bell-bottoms. They thought it was uncool to wear bell-bottoms, and so the st the shops stopped selling them. And uh, yeah, I don't want to rely on. I saw someone in the comments like we can't rely on capitalism, but if we could say we could change people's fashion ideas, kind of like. It's uncool to be racist right now. Does racism still exist? Of course, we haven't eradicated racism. It's still a problem. Slavery. Slavery still exists. It's, some people say there's more people enslaved today than there have been in history. But when we see slavery, when we see racism, we root it out. We say it's horrible. All thinking people agree. Racism is bad. And even the racists know you better you better cool with the racist stuff. That racist stuff ain't cool. You can't that shit don't fly in here. The same thing should happen with speciesism. Make it uncool. It's the least cool thing you can do. It's as uncool as racism. Yeah, well, you say slavery still exists, and that, that is true. And it is true that some people would argue that there's more of it now than ever before. And people will root it out until they want a new T-shirt. <laughs> or, or masks during a pandemic. Because yeah. the, the problem is that it seems to me that most people are unwilling to do something about it, even when they realize that the link between animal exploitation and climate crisis or whatever, mm. they're very reluctant to change their way of life. And what I usually hear is, I hope someone does something about it. I hope the government does something about it. And the most weird of all, oh, uh, why they don't make uh, flesh consumption, they say meat consumption, uh, mm. flesh consumption illegal. So they want someone to come and forbid something. Yeah, It's, it's like they're asking for a, a totalitarian regime or something. They do, don't they? I mean, seatbelt laws. And we all knew that seatbelts will keep your head from going through the windshield, but screen. Sorry, guys, windscreen. If uh, you know, but they had to pass laws in order to get them into cars, in order to get people to wear them. You know, then they pass laws to get them into cars, and then you have to pass laws to get people to wear them. So, I mean, it's it, it's true that there's this uh, paternal style of governance that has to sometimes happen right but it's the individual that's going to make that is this is the problem right in hi historically paternal governments were the ones that made that affected change over long periods of time right this incremental change but now the situation is so dire and so urgently um uh, demanding a, a solution that we have to the individual has to make the decision it's up to you now and maybe you know it's what? too early. You know for what? That. The, the, trouble, the trouble with relying on individuals for me is I think that individuals who are privileged don't want to give up their privilege. And individuals who are not privileged are not in a position to make the changes. And it feels like it's a big ask to rely on individual to, to make big changes, I feel. I think and I think structures are, t are very powerful and industries are very powerful. Uh, compared to, and I, and I know we're made up of individuals, but I think, and I'm sure Roger will speak to this as a sociologist, is that institutions and industries and structures are much more powerful than the some of their component parts of individuals. I think you're That's right. But I would add that the we don't, I just reiterate that I don't think we need everybody to do it. We just need enough. And we just need to reach critical mass and so that it starts looking like its own group of vegans right right now there aren't enough of us and roger will say you know we need more vegans that's the best thing you can do is go out and make more vegans you don't need everyone to go vegan the, the future is vegan because 
without enough people going vegan, then we won't even get to a plant-based world. And we need to be a plant-based world or else there won't be much of us. And you're right, the privileged, I don't, I don't foresee the privileged ever giving up their taste. The bourgeoisie and the upper middle class and the people above them, they, they'll still eat animals because they just because that's what they do. But if enough people are saying we're not living like that anymore, even they will start saying, okay, this ain't cool anymore. This isn't as cool. I, I think the climate uh, crisis will will push more for a plant based yeah. um, way of living, just because of necessity for because of land and because of resources and water and all that yeah. kind of thing. Whether that will bring about vegan values in humans, I don't know, <laughs> because yeah. I think that that's a different conversation, isn't it? A plant based way of living and well, whether I mean, whether people exactly will respect need the, the, vegan advocacy, isn't it, Wendy? Because we we've, we've got to be able to. Because essentially, from our point of view, they'll be doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, and we we need to be able to put the right reason in front of them for them to assess it. And unless there's enough of us doing that, then we won't be able to, you know, push the pea along the road, as it were. I mean, a non-vegan world, a plant-based world, doesn't stop uh, the war problem. Which, to me, you know, veganism as a peace movement. Uh, you know, you, we can all go plant-based and maybe we'll have fewer skirmishes because we'll have enough, there'll be enough resources to go around. But you're, without, without vegan ideals, the first option is violence. Like as soon as someone has something that you, do, you don't have, your first go-to is a violent solution in a, non, in, a, in a non-vegan world. In a vegan world, it's the last resort, you know, because we're observing them, observing their rights first. So I think you're right, Wendy, and I hope that um, there's just going to be enough vegans out there to carry the flag. In a plant-based world, maybe the vegans won't be, um, I guess, looked at so, I don't know, negatively. And I guess we need for that, we need more community building because I think if we're going to be like if we're going to have some more scarce resources we need to be able to share with each other we need to be able to share around and not be like oh I, it's me versus you and here's some i need to resort to violence we need to have community thinking community um and, and compassion for each other and an ability to share and not and, and to understand there is enough for all of us if we share because like you've said i think you've said on your show uh, Sky, it's not. It's not that there's lack of resources to go around. Generally, it's that it's the distribution and, and distribution right. of wealth in this, obviously, in the societies that we have. But I guess we have to have a change of mindset with that because at the moment we're very neoliberalist, individualist. It's all about me. How much can I get? What can I get back? But we have mm. to start learning, yeah, and, and introducing these vegan values. And I think we need to understand vegan values is about peace and is about sharing and community and helping each other. And by that, I include all bodies, whether you're human or human, as right. a community and looking out for each other. Yeah, That's I mean, I, I, feel. I, I completely, I completely agree with you that without the community, then what? I, I, I sometimes lament the fact that religion and that, that veganism isn't a religion. I wish that veganism was more like religion, because I think that. Uh, and people always accuse v- veganism as being a religion, and I'm always like, I wish. I wish it were because I think that we'd have we'd have people uh, chanting in the streets. We'd have we'd have uh, our own our own dogmatic approach to keeping everyone in, in as a united front and moving forward. Um, you know, that we'd community have a lot of money. Too. We'd have a lot of money as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wish that they had that. My, I mean, right now we, we have a discord for vegan, of course, and I'm trying to build a community there. And it's really, it's, it's, it's small, but it's great. And I love the people in there that have become kind of my family now. And I look at, you know, communities built around NFT projects and they're like, they're just extremely active. I almost said the C word. I didn't want to ring the bell the, the, oh. <laughs> I almost used an ableist word. It's they're they're intensely active around an NFT project. And yet, around veganism, it's really hard to get people to go. Like, you want to shake even vegans. And meanwhile, like, I don't know. <laughs> shake a ve- We should have a shake, shake a vegan, a vegan day. day. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of hug a vegan day, shake a vegan day. Uh, that would be very popular, wouldn't it? Uh, tell us a little about your... your uh, Nella. Oh, Nella's, Nella just literally disappeared right at the crucial moment. Me? Yeah. 
No, no, this is good. Vegan Potterhead's been coming up with some really. Uh, by the way, Vegan Potterhead, it's really good to see you on here. Um, lovely vegan to see you back. Potterhead. Seeing you oh, yeah, I thought it was a it's Harry better. Potter reference. Is it a Pothead thing or is it a Potter? Potterhead. I don't know. You said Potterhead or Pothead? Potterhead. Potter. Oh, Potterhead. Potter. Like Not Harry Potterhead. Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter. 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 Potterhead. Um, but coming up with some very good points um, about getting rid of uh, spending, buying less, consuming less, retail, getting rid of retail therapy, uh, mutual aid and support, and uh, also who's for chanting in Leicester City Centre tomorrow? <laughs> Vegan mm-hmm. pothead. <laughs> Nella, what were you going to say? We missed uh, you. Yeah, Nella. Yes, come uh, I was going to say, please tell us about your turkey project. The turkey project, yes. Really um, yeah. Great. So turkey project, mm-hmm. about Two 40 minutes. Two minutes. I got. I do it in thirty seconds. Uh, the turkey project is about forty-five million turkeys are killed in November alone because of our holiday Thanksgiving in the United States of America, and people give away free turkeys. So my idea: we're doing an NFT project so that if you adopt, so when you when you click the button, you'll get a random NFT. The NFTs are all created by the vegan community. So you might get one by someone like Dina Appel, who's a fine artist, a vegan fine artist. Um, you might get some one from uh, oh, Joe the Vegan, who just knows how to do stick figures. But the point is, you donate a JPEG to the project. You can uh, email me at veganocca at gmail.com com i will compile them into an nft project and create a button every time you some every time someone hits the button you adopt a turkey when the turkey is adopted you get a collectible nft so that you have like a little badge of of your of your activism but also a fun kind of gamifying like a gumball machine right you don't know what you're going to get and so you might get like something really worth something or you might get something just just as a symbol of your involvement but i think it's really cool in november we're going to launch how was that? Fabulous. Was that 30 seconds? Yeah, that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, it's art, art from cash for art to, art for to art liberate. Art. Yes. So like I'm involved in NFTs and I'm involved in an NFT project that's for world peace. And I really... You've been I asked think... to explain that, uh, Scott. NFT. NFT is a non-fungible token. Well, this is really great because in the animal rights community, it's really easy to understand what non-fungible means. Fungible, most uh, speciesists would think that one cow is just like any other cow, but we recognize that they are actually individuals. They are non-fungible. One is unique. The other one is unique. The other one is unique. Each one is one of a kind. Now, the reason why um, people like Peter Singer might say that you can replace animals is because they see them as, or livestock animals, right? You see them as fungible. Why? <laughs> what, livestock? Is that why I got that? No, I'm, I'm quoting Peter Singer. Peter Singer. <laughs> oh, Peter Singer. <laughs> yeah, swearing. Peter Singer. You're not allowed to swear on this show. I'm not allowed to swear. <laughs> Peter Singer. Well, I was disagreeing with Peter Singer, to be fair. Welfareist. <laughs> yeah, right. Welfareist. And also, I kind of, I think it's speciesist to say that one animal is, that the animals are fungible. So anyway, non-fungible tokens, same idea. You have a token that is non-fungible. It cannot be exchanged one for one with another. If I took a pound from you and I gave you a pound back, it wouldn't matter. We're both the same amount of pound rich, right? We have the same amount of money, even though we've exchanged a pound for a pound. We just have... I thought non-fungible is that you couldn't squeeze it. You can't squeeze it. Fungiform. <laughs> Spongible, I think. <laughs> anyway, that's non-fungible token. That's what NFT is. Uh, non-fungible token. If you know what a Bitcoin is, I can trade one Bitcoin to you and you give me a Bitcoin. Now we nothing has changed, right? It's a fungible token because it's exchangeable. You sound like a banker now. You give me a bit to- coin and I'll give you a bit of a coin back. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, right? That's uh, Right. It is kind of related to banking in a way because of how ledgers work uh, it relies on the most current technology for that but so so it's one thing you're able to prove its rarity and prove that it's one of a kind and prove that it's real and prove that you own it that is what an nft is it's also programmable for like the metaverse but that's a whole other conversation yeah <laughs> now you, they you... could do other stuff We'll, we'll, we'll give you a minute on this. Line. You you've got a morning show which comes out uh, in this neck of the woods. Well, for me and Wendy, it's four p.m. For Nella, it's six p.m. For you, it's eight a.m. in the morning, and you do it five days a week. And then you've got a school on a Sunday. 
Yeah, we do Sunday school, vegan Sunday school with my, it's funny, well, you know, it's it's my Jewish friend, Lauren, so we thought it'd be funny to do vegan Sunday school, because neither of us, I'm kind of anti-theist, and she's, and she's Jewish, so like the idea, or I think she's, I don't know, she's like a Jewish atheist, but um, so we thought it'd be funny to do the vegan Sunday school, and we talk about how to live audaciously as a vegan on Sundays at 1 p.m. my time, but it's like, I think 3 p.m. her time, I don't know. I'm at, I'm at, at youtube.com slash vegan, of course. Please follow me over there. Subscribe, hit the bell button, and you'll be notified when I do the show. It's uh, But it's five. It's really six days a week, five day, Monday through Friday, and then a special one on Sundays. Yeah, we're coming on your show, around. aren't we, Sky? Yes. Sky, we're coming on, we're coming on your show, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, annual Rye, the Annual Rye show are coming on your show, aren't we? I've asked, I think I've asked each one of you individually to come. Oh, Roger already comes on. Nella, I think yeah, you. I think on. I reached out to you. I know I've reached out to you, Wendy, and like, yeah, I'm tr- always trying to get uh, people vegans to talk about vegan stuff. The show is uh, essentially, it's 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 about vegan friends, right, and learning about each other and how many voices are important, and that every vegan voice needs to be heard in order to make this movement what it is. And so. There's a lot of time spent about how people went vegan and what brought them to it and how their activism is going. So especially on first time guests, that's generally what we talk about with first time guests. But regular guests like Roger will talk about Vegan Time Tunnel every Wednesday. We talk about the history of veganism. And um, on Mondays, we talk about with Nelsie, we talk about nutrition. So every every Monday, we talk a little bit more about nutrition. On Tuesday, we talk about critical concepts. And on Thursday, actually starting next Thursday, we have a... Uh, those goddamn vegan SOBs, they're going to come on on Thursdays as like uh, like comedian comedian veganism. So I think that's pretty funny too. So what, what does SOB mean? Sons of bitches. <gasps> oh, no. You got, that's not really fair, is it? <laughs> Sons of bastards. I don't know. <laughs> Sons of... <laughs> and the, 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 the uh, top up. I'm just going to do the top up for our... Um... Sanctuary the name of the- <laughs> or the bell ring is £4,312.43. Nice. Most That's of that is from good. Race, quite frankly. And, nice. uh, <laughs> and yeah, a bit yeah, from Grumpy. Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> Good job, Reese. The, the show is called Vegan, of course. Vegan, of course, or the, uh, the show, the channel's called Vegan, of course. The idea was that at some point we'll have other shows on there that aren't just me. So it's the show is Vegan, exclamation point, with Sky. Vegan with Sky. I wanted to keep it just really simple so everyone can remember it. Vegan with Sky. The channel is Vegan, of course, because I hope to in the future build like a vegan network where we have other shows on it. So like Wendy might host a show on Wednesdays at 12 or something like that. Make it like a real vegan channel. That was the idea. Wendy's Wednesday Wisdoms. Yes, Wendy's Wednesday's Wisdoms. Yes, exactly. It's really hard to say that, isn't it? Wendy's Whimsical Wednesdays Wisdom. Wendy's Wednesday Wisdom. That's really hard. It's a www. Actually, That's why no one ever says it. They just call it the www. Yeah. Or w- 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 w3. W cubed. W3. Yeah. <laughs> cubed Ws. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new. It's the new cube of. You know what's always the the anonymous for the voiceless. They call it the the cube of truth, don't they? Is that, it's the cube of truth. Mm. But it really isn't a cube, is it? It's more like a square. Like square, a yes. cube. A cube is is three dimensional. There's six sides of a cube. This. The anonymous voiceless oh, is just. I knew there was something about AV I didn't like. Go on, four sides. <laughs> no, four no. Sides. you love you love AV, Roger, don't you? Nearly as much as you love Peter Singer. Yeah, yeah, you've uh, you've got problems with everybody though, don't you, Roger? Peter. Like, oh, yeah, and Peter. Yeah, <laughs> Peter and Peter. Peter. I like what you said, Peter Singer, and then Peter. Peter. But it sounded like the same thing. Yeah. Peter and Peter. 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 <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to work on Roger that. Just, Roger just doesn't like Peter, whether it be Singer or Newkirk. She... <laughs> Peter Any, Newkirk. Anybody called Peter is my enemy. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose that <laughs> was so related to Roger, right? Like, uh, you give someone a good Petering or a good Rogering, you have the same kind of. <laughs> Wendy, I love to say Rogering. Are you? When I'm talking to a guy named Roger, I think I'm fair. Oh, I think yeah, it's yeah. fair game. <laughs> 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 I'm, 
I, I don't I don't think Sky spent an, an hour in his life more thinking about <laughs> thinking about what not, not to say what I'm not going to say right yes yeah. absolutely what not to say yeah. You, yeah you could have given me a heads up on that I could have mentally prepared to, uh, what I'm what I'm allowed to say didn't we like the, to keep you on your toes Sky indeed the, they say there's no <laughs> vegan police but here we are at the uh, animal rights group animal, animal rights <laughs> <show>. <laughs> If you use a spe if you misgender or mispronoun an animal, you are taking away your vegan superpowers. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm waiting for all my hair to fall out. You got to be very very careful when you've got Colleen on your show and me at the same time. Well, Colleen's interesting. She'll dedicate hours. Like she did, I think the horse aphorism. She calls them animologies, as a term that she has coined. And I listened to her podcast two hours about um about horse aphorisms and animologies, whatever. And I, I found it somewhat fascinating because there were some that I really didn't really, I didn't realize came from horses. She's wonderful. I really like the joyful vegan. I think she's pretty great, but she does, she does dwell on the language stuff quite a bit. And she's the first one to actually get me to admit that language when it comes to the animal aphorisms is important to consider. Cause like a, for years, I was like, whatever. I, I, I like animal aphorisms. I think they're funny. But she was like, don't put violence out into the world. Like, your language and your um, your energies matter. And I thought, you know what? You're right, Colleen Patrick Godot. So now I consider it more. I won't say the cat was let out of the burlap sack. or I won't use mm. those. Or I try not to. Yeah, no, it's to, true. It's true, isn't it? It is it's violence through our language, I, I guess. And also it's perpetuating the state. It's quite perpetuating how people see other animals and how what they will tolerate for them, how they, you know, how they will, how they see them in the world and how they relate to them. Is, right. Is yeah. I mean, because I, I don't. through language. Yeah. But I mean, it's a, a, addressed like you 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 put that out through your person i mean it's the same thing for years i don't want to wear faux leather because i don't like people thinking that that's normal like it's normal to wear the skin of another animal so even faux leather like i'm not i'm not calling anybody else out but it's a personal choice that i've made that i don't like to wear faux leather because i think it normalizes wearing the skin of an animal of another animal and when when she said something, something about the way she talked about animal aphorisms made me think, oh, God, I'm doing the same thing with my language. Basically, I need to adjust the way I present myself because I don't want to normalize. I don't know. Like there's ones, the horse ones are rough because they're like, it, it's everywhere. Home stretch. Like I, that was one that I was like, oh, my God, a home stretch. We're in the home stretch. That's an animal exploitation uh, saying, and oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, it? Yeah. it really is. And she also said but it's a form of activism to like, if I say cut two, cut two carrots with one knife, it's people go, what? Yeah. Well, I don't like to say the bird one, the bird and the stone one. It gives you a but, chance to oh, like, no, explain so, yourself. No. So we say feed two birds with one scone. Oh yeah. That's a good one. Feed two birds with one scone. Uh, that, that's cut. political use of the language. I mean, you challenge the, the notion people have about other animals and that you're about to start some conversations. Right. And I find that that's an easier way to address. <laughs> Each time one of you hit Sorry, I was, like, just laughing, like, I was just laughing. I was just laughing at it. <laughs> <laughs> the family maker. I like oh, it. Oh, I'm going to start using that on my I wish, show. I always. Like In the wedding tackle. <laughs> In the yeah. wedding tackle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, you're absolutely right. It's a we're, way of we're, politicizing your speech. We're 20 minutes over almost, so are we oh, going to draw this to, a, to an end or what? What? Yes. Well, I we ought to. Uh, I know in Yorkshire they take their time very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Yorkshire. <laughs> so was Roger. Um, Yorkshire. Yeah, me and Ro Roger was lived in bands, lady. You, Roger. I All the good people are from Yorkshire, like uh, Donald Watson. I yeah. used to when I when I lived in Germany, my my roommate was from Leicester, but he always had um, Yorkshire tea was something that we always had in the house. Uh, he was my my roommate, and uh, when There's and no he Leicester lived in tea. what's that? There's no Leicester <laughs> tea. There's no Leicester tea, but Yorkshire tea. But you could make two cups with one bag. That was like. <laughs> 
oh, the yeah. trick, apparently. And it said it on the box, and I found that kind of funny because, I don't know, I got really into Yorkshire tea. So anytime you guys talk about Yorkshire, I'm always thinking, ah, oh, they have great tea in Yorkshire. <laughs> Of course, it's taken <laughs> taken from people in India, but um, <laughs> but still, yeah, stolen stolen cash crop. Um, right. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, Roger, we have... be- before we go, uh, you have oh. something to say about Laura and our next oh, yeah. show? Yeah, ah, do, do, yes, yes, yes. do you want to announce that, Nella? Oh, I don't like. No, she doesn't. You you do it. No, I'm oh, sorry. I thought, I thought she was shaking her head. Sorry, no, I thought you were shaking your head. Yeah, no, you do it. Do Come on, Roger. Go ahead, Roger. No, no, no. Go ahead, Roger. <laughs> Roger, go do it. Come on. Am Roger. I doing it? Roger, yes. one more thing before we go. Could you Can introduce you the thing about Laura? Laura? What? <laughs> well, could you do the thing? Could you do the thing about Laura? Roger, one more thing before you go. Could you do the thing about Laura? What? <laughs> Deb, oh Deb says we've all proven that humor is alive and well with vegans. We have, we've got a right chuckle tonight, haven't we? I think we're in one of those moods. Roger. Michael, you you were late, yeah, weren't you, Michael? But nice to see you, Michael. Worst impression of a Yorkshire accent award to Sky. Come on, I got her Pita. <laughs> Pita and Pita. I thought that was pretty good. Yorkshire. That's not very Yorkshire. No, Yorkshire's York- not like that, uh, mate. You know what you're talking about. Talking <laughs> about <laughs> that was that went a bit London then, no? I'm actually from Yorkshire. I can't even That's Yorkshire. That's how Yorkshire. Yorkshire. <laughs> that did, Wendy. I did it with uh, Manchester. Oh, no, I was Union then. Yeah, Laura Schleifer is coming on the show the next time. So it's the first uh, Tuesday of next month. And the reason for that is um, she appeared at a um, conference. I think it was Total Liberation Anarchist based. Mm -hmm. And um, her presentation was the only one that they had some technical problems for. So we've, we've reached out and offered her to be able to present it here. So it'll be a PowerPoint with... Um, Q and A at the end, and the reason for that then is that it will be there for posterity. So that's the idea. Posterity. So that's going to be the next posterity. Mm. And we love having Flora as a guest. It's always and you're to people for us to say that, Wendy. Posterity. No, I like it. I like posterity. it. Um, <laughs> What, what, how do you say door in in Yorkshire? <laughs> you told me you told me once, Roger. It's like show the door foil, the go foil. What was it? How do you no, say? No, it? no. Um, my my brother, that's my brother. He used to put. He used to say, "Put wooden foil." Put wooden foil. Put the wood in the hole. In the hole. The yeah. The yeah. Put the wooden foil. Yeah, put wooden foil. <laughs> put the wooden foil. Yeah. Put the wooden foil. <laughs> Like it's like it's, <laughs> everything, everything. Like I think this is why Americans love Harry Potter because everyone's kind of like they all talk like they're kind of singing, and they all like. <laughs> and then when they're mean, they sound like nothing sounds more villainous than a British person speaking kind of just meanly, just just angrily, like Harry Potter. Like it's just I imagine <laughs> the uh, like I've never been to a Sabs, you know, a Sabs event, but like the fox hunt the hunt sabs that standoff must be so intense because the hunt sta- hunt sabs are like fuck you you party and then the other one's like yo blood and all that and it just seems like no 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 noise. Gonna, gonna, i don't know where you're getting this from it's all wrong the, the the most successful sabs are the ones who concentrate on sabbing and you ignore the hunters you don't you don't ignore the hunt staff very much because they're in control of the hounds. But you ignore the field, which is the one the riders, mm. and the ones you you need to ignore most are the are the foot and car followers, because they are there just to kind of piss you off, mm. engage you in kind of conversation and argument, which means that you can't concentrate on sabbing. So the most successful sabs that I've ever been on have been without confrontation because you don't engage in it. In fact, that pisses them off even more. I mean, I've I've had hunters right up to me, get off my land and all that, and we used to ignore them. We used to whisper between ourselves. They used to go purple with rage because they, they're they not used to people ignoring them. Right, but the sound that would be emitting from their mouths whilst being purple with the rage, to me, would be something frightfully similar to like what must, must... I think that's how the English Empire ruled, right? It's just that they sound... So, like the way... They're able to emit anger through their mouth holes is something that I don't think any mouth other, holes. Um, yeah, I don't think that they're holes in their faces. The English are particularly good at it. Yeah, like 
even even when you know like mr gandy will find out that he that the take a bit more than salt to crumble the english empire like it just seems so <laughs> so perfectly villainous Oh. You're welcome. That's because that's because they've always put Brit, like or yeah, English particularly, I English, guess, yeah. as, as villains in uh, in like it yeah, works. A lot of yeah, movies, they? Like if you want a good Nazi, yeah. you call up Brannig. You call up one of these. You call up anyone who can do a good English accent. That's how. That's how you know that person's a Nazi in the movie. The swastika, forget about it. The English accent. That even in Star Wars, right? Like they're all of English accent. All the baddies have English accents. I'm the goodies. <laughs> the goodies are all Americans, though, aren't they? No, I guess some of them. Like... B- Boyega fakes an American accent, but you're right. The but Luke Skywalker is American accent. Now yeah. here's a good question from Joanne: Why Sky? Yeah, that's a good why? question. I don't know yeah. why Sky. Why ask yeah. why? I, I you know <laughs> what is this? Sky is the languagiest. Ring the bell, race lever. I don't know what did I say now? Did I say something languagey? Languagist. Because, languagist. I think it's because you're. Um, oh, it's not sexist. English it's not speciesist. Is... It's languagist. Languagist. <laughs> I am a languagist it, when it comes. It's, ac- it's accentist. 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 Yes. Accentist. Harry yeah. Potter. Like even when they're. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because obviously. I'm I'm going to end like the show before before he does his Scottish. Thing. Oh, one more one more thing, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, one more thing, oh, Roger. What do you think about... Uh, we'll be here at like three in the morning going, one more thing, Roger, we're going. One more, yeah. one more thing, Roger. What about this other activist group that you dislike? Roger likes everyone. Hang on, I'll just get my list. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, opens the scroll. Yeah. Yeah, Roger, what about, what about Gary Francioni? What about the Francioni crew? Like, uh... yeah, He doesn't like being called Francioni for a start. Oh, I know he doesn't. That's why I said yeah. it that way. Francio. Yeah, Steve, Steve Best used to call him Francioni on purpose because he knew it wound him up. I've always liked that about academics. They, they they tend to have these little secret ways of jabbing each other. I think it's hilarious. Like, I mean, no, never mind. I could tell that story. Anyway, the uh, <laughs> sorry, I was thinking about. I there were three national poet laureates that were at a at a bar mitzvah and. They were all. They were all. The joke now. It, 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 it joke seems like, like yeah, English Irish Scotsman going to a bar. No, this is a true it? story. But like at the end of the day, it's like it's like Robert has Robert. Uh, uh, they're all Roberts, and they all have like, but they're all at a bar mitzvah, telling Jewish jokes in the back of the at the back of the hall, uh, because one of Robert Pinsky, I think, I think it was his child's bar, bar mitzvah, but he's yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, but they all love to razz each other. Academics, they're um, they're biting, aren't they? That's why they don't fit in. That's why everyone hates them. Did you hear about the Englishman, the Irishman, and the Scotsman who went into a bar and they enjoyed their drink and had a great time? <laughs> right. And they all got on. And they, they went home on. quite sober. No, yeah. They all got on with each other. Yeah, they, they were they very reasonable. home in time for a cup of Yorkshire tea. Very temperate with their... Uh, with their amounts, yeah. and, and religion and politics didn't come up, and they never <laughs> talked about how much money they made. No. Well, look, the last one from she's she's been bo- yeah. bossing the chat chat around all 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 the chat, which is pretty good. So well, good. well done, Joanna. Good, Joanna. Thank you everybody for um for tuning in. I think we had about thirty three um at one time. So thank you very oh, much. Nice. We shall be back uh, next month. One more thing, Roger. Can you plug the show? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And don't forget to... Uh, Wednesday. What happens on Wednesday, Roger? Don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm going I'm to mute you in a minute. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I thought you were coming on my show on Wednesday. Aren't you going to give a preview of what, what you're going to talk about? Vegan Time yeah, Tunnel. I'm going to talk about the history of the movement. But you always talk about the history of the movement on Wednesday. Well, fine, I thought there was... So, that, so that's, the, that's the weekly preview of, of what I'm going to talk about. That's not a preview. I thought you were going to tell me, is it Leslie Cross this week? I wanted to. I, thought, I was hoping it's Leslie Cross. No, it's not, not Leslie Cross. A vegan, a priest, and a crossfitter that entered a bar with Roger Yates. <laughs> and they never left. Actually, I don't, I, don't like, I don't tend to go to bars. I don't like them. Right. Thank you very much, either. everyone. This is, Thanks, um, everyone. The Animal Rights Bye. Show signing off. So, I know, I've got to go and do Brian now. Finally. I've got to go do Brian. Finally.
Finally, come on, Nella. What you, you, know, you were only here half the time. You left. You left halfway through when you froze. You came back thirty minutes later. Come on, Nella. Yeah. We never, we never managed to stop at one hour. I mean, why would you want to? You know why? Because vegans are too. We're like the vegan diaspora. We're not able Brian to alarm. actually. Oh, that was your alarm. That's Brian's alarm. Little, little diabetic. Little Brian cat is diabetic. He has to have his injection. Brian K. Food and injection, 7.30. I don't know what a Brian K is. Brian Cat. He's a cat person. Brian Cat. Brian the cat. A cat called Brian. Oh, like the life of Brian. Yeah, it is. He's always looking on the bright side. Very much. He's very positive. Very positive young man. He does. And he's... He's not the Messiah. He's a very naughty boy. He's a very naughty, <laughs> very a naughty, naughty cat. A Star Wars or Star Trek, right? Birdie V? All right, quick lightning round. Star Wars or Star Trek, <laughs> Roger? Uh, Star Trek. Nella? Star Trek Star uh, Trek or Star Wars? Neither. Neither? I'm not a fan. Not a fan. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What about you, Wendy? When, when Star, Wars. <laughs> Star Wars? Star <laughs> Wars? No contest. Oh, hell yeah. No contest. Star no Wars, one's ve- on only Wars. Chewbacca's vegan in Star Wars. Uh, you know, I may have a video on my channel about uh, about Chewbacca and how his vegan journey is described in all the movies with Chewbacca. Chewbacca is the only character who has an arc in all of Star Wars, and it's a vegan arc. He goes vegan by the end of it. Mm-hmm. It's really great. I wish you would see it, Wendy, since you're a Star Wars fan. But almost mm-hmm. everyone's vegan in Star Trek, and they talk about it. They talk about the rights of, of, of – they call them lower life forms, which is a little speciesist. But they do say like – you know, we we used to hunt lower life forms, but we don't anymore because we realize that everyone everyone has rights. All right, Roger, there you go. Star Trek, go watch some Star Trek, Roger. Yes. Okay. Right. Goodbye, everyone. One I more thing, Roger. We're gonna have to get rid of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we still have that eject button? Okay. Right, we need I an ejector seat. I don't know about a button. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the Animal Rights Show. Thank you so much.